Riz Ahmed is the star of the new film Sound of Metal, where he plays a heavy metal drummer who loses his hearing. I'm Kevin Jacobson of Gold Derby here with Riz. And to start off, uh, we've seen a lot of stories and films about people who are coping with disability or trying to overcome something. And sometimes that can fall into cliches, whereas I think this movie kind of rises above those kinds of classic stereotypes in a lot of ways. So was there an element to the script or just how the story was being presented that really appealed to you in that way? It was just the script was incredible, really. That was all I knew about it when I first came to the project. I didn't know Darius. I wasn't even aware before I met him of his past credits and how he'd worked on some of my favorite films with Blue Valentine and Place Beyond the Pines. So it was really just the quality of the writing itself which spoke for itself. Um, it was it was just deeply moving and so specific and unique. Then when I met Darius, we really connected. We both have a kind of similar relish for throwing ourselves in the deep end with kind of, um, you know, things that may be a bit scary or challenging. And um, he threw down his gauntlet of, look, whoever's going to play this role, want, you know, I want them to be really drumming when they're drumming on screen, which I found scary, but also really exciting, you know, that, possibility of trying to learn that new language alongside also learning American Sign Language for the role. And um, so it was, you know, at that point after I'd met him, I was kind of like, listen, I'm, I've got to find a way to, to do this and make this happen. Yeah, well, like you said, you learned drums, you learned ASL, you're also speaking in an American accent. There's, I feel like there's a lot of challenges on top of everything. Um, and I don't know what your typical processes when it comes to approaching roles but it feels like you really went above and beyond to prepare for this part maybe more than others that you've played so what what was it about this role in particular that really drove you to really want to play it authentically well I, I hope I'm kind of always driven to try and play roles authentically I guess it was just that in this film there are these kind of technical skills that I had to learn and the you know what I wanted to do for real. Um, there's always a kind of lot of research, I guess, that goes into anything I do. So for the night of, you know, I, I would visit prisons and speak to people who would serve time there um, with public defenders, go to courtrooms, interview people, or with sisters, brothers or something historical. You know, I was learning a lot about, um, about the frontier, and, and, you know, in the West and the gold rush at that time and the kind of um, kind of proto-socialist um, commune movements around that time. You know, with this, it was a different kind of research just because it's, um, you've got to learn these skills and you've got to kind of perform them on camera. Um, so in that, to that extent, I guess there was um, nothing different about the process. It just was going to take a lot longer because I needed to learn to, to play this instrument and I needed to become fluent in this, in this new language. And that just takes a lot of time. But what I realized in the process of learning these skills is that they were preparation, not just for the skills, but for the character. I think they really influenced me as a person and influenced the performance in that they're both forms of nonverbal communication. And with Ruben not being the most chatty kind of character, um, spending seven months kind of nonverbally communicating, I think uh, just opened me up as a performer in, in different ways. Um, yeah, well, speaking to that, was there something about Ruben that maybe even came more naturally? Something about his personality, his love of music that you sort of felt like you could identify with? Yeah, for sure. I think you always try and look for those overlaps between yourself and the character. You know, like Ruben, I'm someone who's obsessed with their work and, you know, um, kind of derives a lot of their joy and sense of self from their creative expression. And so um, I guess I could tap into that feeling of what it's like to, to have that potentially taken away from you. I've certainly experienced versions of that at different moments as an actor and a musician thinking, man, can I continue doing this? You know, I'm broke or can I continue doing this? What's the point? I'm not getting anywhere or um, should I continue doing this? I'm exhausted. I'm burnt out. You know, um, I think the creative life can kind of present these different challenges and, and um, and so I guess I tr tried to kind of tap into that alongside also just spending a lot of time, you know, talking to people and, and, um, and, and understanding their experience, you know, on just an, on an emotional level, even if I haven't lived it. 
Well, something that I noticed in your performance is that I think you had a lot of opportunities to go big and, you know, you still are able to express a lot of emotion, but it feels like it's so much more internalized than you might expect from a character who's going through this intense personal trauma. And I think that kind of helps Ruben feel more real and three-dimensional. So how much of that was your own choices as an actor or was it always just the intention of from Darius Martyr, the director, to have you play it in that way? You know, I guess, you know, it's interesting you, you say that. Thank you. That's, you know, really kind of you to say as well. But it's, it's funny because, you know, when you're playing a character, or at least when I'm playing a character, I try not to think about those, make any big picture decisions like that. Um, you know, he's generally going to be an internal character or a really expressive character. Um, in a way, I kind of don't want to be able to draw a clean line around the characters I play and know up front how they might, you know, drink a glass of water or walk across the room or how they might react in a situation. I kind of just try and put all the kind of ingredients in the, in the pot and stir them and then you see what bubbles up in that moment. And I guess maybe what you're referring to is, is Ruben's attempt to kind of tough it out, you know, and be self-reliant and um, not show weakness. And, and to some extent, his kind of alienation from his vulnerability and, you know, his, the, the kind of um, his sudden hearing loss it kind of puts him in touch with his vulnerability. And he's kind of fighting, kicking and screaming all the way through to, to not come face to face with his vulnerability, but it's something that, that, that he is confronted with. So I guess it's always gonna be a bit of a struggle getting him to take off the armor because he is a character who's so self-reliant and has had to survive and take, and is a caretaker. He's taking care of Lou for a long time as well and she's taking care of him. So I guess, um, yeah, there weren't, there weren't any kind of bigger decisions like that made by, by myself or Darius, I guess, we just kind of surrendered to what felt right in that moment. Now, having said that, I think that there are many moments when Ruben is maybe more explosive and expressive, and sometimes it's not when he expects it, but it's also on the drums. You know, I think that is the way that he metabolizes his difficult feelings. That is his catharsis, that's his expression. So with that taken away, it's not just his job, his girlfriend, his sense of self, it's also his kind of coping mechanism almost is taken away from him. And we, I wanted it, I guess one thing that we did talk about is that when he's on the drums, he's, he's his fullest self. Yeah, yeah. And you mentioned Lou, uh, you work alongside Olivia Cook in the beginning and then in the end of the film, especially uh, playing, playing Ruben's girlfriend. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how much work the two of you put into building that relationship to yeah. feel like it had a sense of history to it. Man, Olivia is amazing. She's incredible. And um, I'd already been preparing the drums and, and ASL for five months when she joined the project and we had two months to go. And then she kind of jumped in with, <clears throat> you know, learning the guitar and loop pedals and, <clears throat> excuse me, this very particular kind of um, noise band kind of brand of screaming you know that is very very draining and and so our main interaction was through rehearsals in the run-up to the film in the, in the last couple of weeks in the run-up to, to to making the film we, we do band rehearsals and that, those band rehearsals were were intense and scary and we were like man are we going to be able to pull this together because Darius wanted us to play in a real nightclub with a real audience and play a real gig um, so it was pretty nerve wracking, but in that kind of panic of those last few weeks, I think we really bonded and, and, and became quite close and, it, and it, I guess it felt very quickly like we were almost living that experience together in that little trailer. Um, I think just the nature of the script, the way that Darius likes to shoot, it feeling very observational and the fact that we, we did very few takes on each scene. And the fact that we shot chronologically meant that we were kind of living that relationship a little bit and living into it as we were shooting. 
Um, so I think a lot of that was down to the kind of conditions that Darius created around the shoot allowed us to kind of really lock into something. And I think some of the best scenes in the movie come from Ruben's experience at this sober house for the deaf. And your scenes with Paul Racy as the, as the leader of the community are very compelling, as are all the scenes with him interacting with the younger kids at the house. Um, what was it like working with that group, that environment? It was incredible. It was, it was a tremendous privilege. I, um, I just, like most hearing people had not interacted very much with people in the deaf community, sadly. And to be welcomed into that community, to understand more about their culture and learn the language was just an amazing gift. And, you know, they, I learned a lot as an actor about embodied communication, really inhabiting what you're, what you're expressing with your body. Because, you know, my sign instructor, Jeremy, would often tell me that there's a trope in the deaf community that hearing people are emotionally repressed because we hide behind words. And I found that to be actually quite true in the sense that when I was able to become more fluent in ASL and express things that I wouldn't have got super emotional about if I was talking about, it might have been emotional subjects, but when I was speaking in ASL, I was getting really emotional physically. And, um, you know, Jeremy explained that's because you're inhabiting and embodying what you're saying with your whole physical being when you're communicating like that. And so what I found working with, you know, those actors from the deaf community was just the most grounded, embodied, present kind of communication. And, you know, we talk a lot about listening as actors. You don't just listen with your ears. You listen with your whole body. It's about being present. And I found them to be some of the most, you know, yeah, present and embodied actors I've ever worked with. Paul Racy is an incredible treasure that I can't wait the whole world, for the whole world to see what he can do, um, you know, He's had been work. He's been working for like 35, 40 years, and as he said, mainly he kind of come would come in and do one day on a project. He described himself as a career day player, and it's just you kind of think about you know his talent that have been overlooked for so long, but all the talent also in the wider deaf community um, that have been that just overlooked in film, and and I'm just excited about some of this talent kind of having a having a platform, and I hope that we see uh, more actors from the deaf community in film. Well, I was curious, how has the response been from, from what you've seen from those in the deaf community and what they've thought of the film? Um, you know, so far, touch wood, so good. You know, I, I see people online and hear people at Q&As and have read articles where I think, you know, some people in the deaf community that, that I've seen have described it as a, as a kind of bit of a game-changing film for many reasons. One is because you don't normally get to see deafness portrayed as anything other than a disability. And for Rubin, he might be under the misapprehension that it is, a, it is that. But for the film, it's pretty clear that deafness is a culture. It's an invitation to connect to people you might not have otherwise um, connected with when you step into deaf culture. And also for Rubin, as I found as an actor learning ASL, it's an opportunity to connect more to yourself, you know, stepping into deaf culture. Um, I think it's also just, the, just the fact that deaf actors outnumber hearing actors in this film, I think probably. Um, and also the fact that the entire film is closed captioned so that, you know, deaf and hearing people will be having a very similar experience of watching this film, which is not, you know, always the case. Although actually there's sequences uh, with American sign language that aren't captioned for hearing audiences. So it's catering more to deaf audiences in that sense. So for all those reasons, I, th I think, you know, I'm really proud to say that so far that the response that I've seen has been overwhelmingly positive and, and, and people seem to be quite moved to, to be kind of seen um, in this way. Yeah, I like I liked that choice artistically too have the closed caption kind of burnt in. Um, well, you mentioned the night of earlier. Since we're at awards website, I wanted to congratulate you also on getting a nomination from the Gotham Awards for your performance here. And uh, I also wanted to go back to a few years ago when you won your Emmy for the night of. Um, can you talk about any memories of that night and whether that project and that character has just stayed with you in the years since you've played him? Mm. 
Yeah, I think, um, you know, whenever you kind of step into play a character, um, I, I guess part of that experience stays with you. And for me, I just think a lot about my time in Queens working with South Asian Youth Action, which is an amazing kind of nonprofit working with, you know, um, young Asian youth in Queens, working with the Innocence Project, um, uh, you know, the overturned wrongful convictions using DNA, new, you know, new DNA evidence. And I just think about the public defenders and all the people that I met there. And I think those those experiences, those interactions really stay with you. Um, in terms of that night of, of winning that award, I just remember, um, I guess I just feel so, I just felt, it just felt so surreal. You know, it always does. You work on something for ages and, and then it's a long time before people even see it. And then it's a long time after that, that, you know, something like being an awards show might happen. And, and it kind of feels strangely so disconnected from the process of making it that it, it, it feels quite surreal. You're getting, it's like, you know, well done on eating this apple. We're going to give you a goat. It's like, what is that? These two things seem to have nothing to do with each other on some level and yet of course of course it does and it, it kind of brings it all home so it's it's always a kind of um surreal moment of you know time travel when you're reminded of work that you were so engrossed in years ago um kind of like takes you snaps you right back to that experience which is which is beautiful you know it's it's a beautiful kind of way of being asked to look back and remember and um kind of walk walk that journey again in your in your mind um and to feel grateful i just remember just feeling so grateful you know to to be there for people to have connected with it yeah well going to the future now in this final minute or so um is there anything i'm sure there is that that you'll take with you from your experience of playing ruben that you feel even has changed you on a personal level or professionally just with even the way you might approach roles in the future yeah, I think so. I think on a personal level, it opened me to the to the you know these subcultures of the punk scene and to deaf culture, and the relationships in that, and you know learning the drums, learning ASL. I think it, as I said, it opened me up as a performer in, in a more physical way, and I like to kind of move forwards with that in the work that I'm doing and working more physically and just thinking about thinking about that. Um, and uh, and I guess as a person as well, just kind of being aware of um yeah just being just being more aware of the cultures that i might not have already stepped into and kind of and seeking them out seeking out roles that can continue to allow me to to learn you know i think that the best the most creatively fulfilling work is also often the scariest work where you feel like you're in over your head you're overwhelmed and you're out of the depth and so I guess the experience of making Sound of Metal makes me think more and more about um, creatively going in that direction where there's more learning, there's more growth, but also maybe more fear. Because if you're not fully in control, then I think you're forced to kind of let go. And that's when interesting things can happen. Yeah, and we're looking forward to some of those interesting things. Um, Riz, I really appreciate you talking with me today about this very special film. Thank you. And uh, for those of you watching, hit like and subscribe for more interviews just like this and head to goldderby.com and start making your Oscar predictions, Golden Globe predictions, all kinds of predictions. Uh, Riz, thanks again. Cheers. Take care. Thank you.